<laughs> All right, so today I'm gonna show you how to safely and accurately cut returns on molding, especially small molding. And you know what a return is. It's this little piece where it deadheads into the middle of a field, okay? So it's a really nice way of terminating a, the shoe mold. But the key to it is this little piece, right? Okay, it's easy to cut, but it's hard to find when you cut it on a saw like this because this little piece wants to go flying. So step over here and let me show you how, how I like to cut shoe mold returns. So if you've ever cut small moldings on a chop saw, slide comp on my this saw, this little piece wants to go flying and you're totally searching for it. So the way I like to cut returns, especially on a small molding like this, is pretty simple. I like to set up a small mita box. So when I put this in, I can accurately align this just like this, because this is a perfect 90. I cut 45s and I also cut 22 and a half. Or like this was a 25 degree angle I needed at one time. But here's the problem with this. I put this together really quick many years ago. And if you see this, it's, it's a little tired, <laughs> okay? I've used this so many times. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to make a small miter box to fit your saw. I just dimensioned my lumber for the miter box. And there's some determinations on a few things that you need to know. The most critical part is this, look. And the way I dimension that is because of the saw I use. I want to get at least a decent stroke out of this as I'm cutting. But there's another thing to consider is what kind of moldings you're going to be doing returns on. Yes, you can do basic 90 degree cuts, but also 45s with this. So like I did before, I got the 45 on this with my uh, powered miter saw, but now I want to cut the return. So I'm going to basically do 90 on this. But this chair rail will fit in there as well, and you can get your uh, 90s on that. You can have a variety of these mitre boxes depending on your saw, but here is the, I got, I'll go back with the most important part. The, the fence height, I usually just make them about that high, 50 millimeters, it's just really easy for me to remember. But the number one thing is this has to be perfectly parallel, because we're gonna be putting those sides like this together. And make sure your wood's milled perfect. But this is what I always double check right in here. I check my dimension here. Oh, perfect. And absolutely perfect from end to end. This is a perfect parallel piece. So I'm ready to go. I'm gonna choose the right domino for this. And this is a butt joint. Okay, now rule of thumb is a third, third, and a third on this build. This is basically 18 millimeters thick or three quarters thick dimension cherry. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose a five by 30 because you're probably thinking, oh, third, third, and a third rule, 18 millimeters divided by three is six. So I'll use a six by 40 domino. But I'm gonna use a five by 30 because I don't like to mess around with my settings. I could go 15 one side, right? And 25 into this side and it would be good with a six by 40. But I'm gonna use a five by 30 because I'm gonna go 15 and 15. So let's get going with the domino and uh, we'll put these together. Okay, I know there's probably an easier way to do this, but this is the way I like to do it because I have to orientate my domino machine on the back side of this so I have it perfectly flush. So I pressed down to my bench top here and made sure that that was perfectly flush with the sides. On the bottom, I'm gonna flip it over so I can do a little bit of layout and it will make it wicked easy. What I'm gonna do is first of all, this is gonna be my reference, just like this, okay? These are how my boards are going across, right? But then I'm gonna take a measuring device, and it doesn't have to be perfect, but I'm gonna go right here, look, uh, 105. I'm gonna go f uh, 40 from each side. I'm gonna come in here, I'll just grab 40 on each side. Okay, just like this, it's perfectly flush. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna scribe my lines all the way across like this. 
Okay, now this line is important because this is where I'm gonna put the plate of my domino joiner, and you'll see this in a few minutes. I'm gonna come over here and grab this line like this. Okay, and I also have my reference right here. I see it right here? So these will put my six dominoes. One, two, and I have my reference. So I know I'm gonna, as I take this apart, just like this, okay, I know this is where I'm gonna put my plate here, and this is where I'm gonna put my plate here. So I'll have a perfectly flush joint. I'm going to reference this face, and I'm gonna be plunging horizontally with the domino. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do these in the loose setting. The piece is gonna gain strength anyhow because it's long grain to long grain. So I'm gonna make these loose, and then these on the vertical, when I plunge vertical, I'll make those tight. We're gonna do the mortises on these two pieces. These are the side fences for the um, miter box. Now, I marked it where I'm, go where I'm going to put my fence here of my domino, but we know the plate goes on these lines, but here's the situation. I usually like to plunge these vertically. We're gonna put it in a tight setting, but this gets in the way on these small pieces. These are 50 millimeters tall. So I'm going to plunge this way with it, but what I did is I ganged these together so I have more support. If you, it, you will have less wobbling on that plate and that fence, so I'll get a perfect 90 degree plunge. See how the stable that is? Always make sure that plate sits nice and flat. Make sure that plate is nice and flat. I'm gonna flip it around and do these, but I'm always gonna make sure, okay, that's the inside. Okay, so I know this is simple, but we got our desired result because we labeled our work. You're gonna see the cap in this triangle, but you can also see those lines that we made. And if you have a bunch of things to make, always make sure you reference it and label everything. That is Woodworking 101. We knew where to place our machine to get the desired result, okay? We wanted a perfectly flush joint. The other thing I'm always gonna suggest is always, always do a dry fit. And we did that already. And you're gonna see how it all came together. Now we're gonna go into glue up. Okay, so one of the things I'm gonna show you is when you go into glue up, with anything you do. Make sure you have your area set up so you're not scrambling for things. I know this is a simple piece that we're putting together, but I have a bucket of water here, I have a wet rag, I have my clamps ready to go, and here's a couple tips I'm gonna show you. These mortises are the ones we made a little bit wider, you see this way, okay? Don't start putting your dominoes in these, put them in the tight so that's your benchmark. And when you're doing this, what I like to do is I like to coat the domino like this, okay? And press fit them in here like that. Make sure you have a, a dead blow hammer here to put them in, okay? just like this, and I'm gonna get these in here like this. Make sure they're completely coated. That way there you get a good long grain to long grain glue line. I don't put uh, glue in the mortise. I never have. I've never had a, a failure, um, especially with these short ones. But as I put them in, I'm gonna do something else because remember what I said earlier in the video? This is long grain to long grain adhesion here, right? When I put this here. So I'm also going to coat You'll see a little of this coming down here, okay? But I'm also going to coat this right here, okay? Just like this. So you get all that long grain to long grain adhesion and you're gonna get a perfect glue line. So there you go. So once you get it together, just make sure it's in like that. Now, 
See that right there? See how that's a little proud and that is as well? That's why we made it, those, uh, the lateral tolerance on this piece long, okay? And we'll just get it in to the clamps. So I'm gonna get it into clamps like this. You know, I always hear over the years, you can put too much pressure on the clamps. No. Nope. And they say, oh, starving the joint. No. Nope. So I'm gonna stand it up like this so you guys can see it. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna over crank it, but I'm gonna bring my joint together. And I'm just gonna clean up here a little and clean that up in there. Just like this, just like this. That's all it's gonna take everybody. And that's all it is. Okay, and then come around here and you're gonna see that's a perfect butt joint right there. So that's all. And I make sure my rag isn't sopping wet. I wring it out, cause I'm just trying to clean that up. I don't wanna put too much water in there. And that's it. Okay, so the glue is dry. Let's take it out of the clamps and go over to the bench and make our curfs in there with our saw. Okay, so out of the glue up, I noticed I had a little squeeze out and I had some rough marks here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna take a moment with a couple of hand planes to uh, clean it up. But first, a lot of people, check this out, Chris, come in here and see this. Everybody wants to know why I always have those extra blades in there. They dull, they break. And they're from my um, razor blade here, my utility knife. But I love these because they're always right there. And if I have glue squeeze out sometimes in there, I use this like a little scraper and I can get that corner right in there to clean out that squeeze out. Okay, just like that. Okay, because that's where you really need to have that perfect. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up here. I'm just gonna clean this edge up here really quick. I'm just gonna set up my bench like this. Just like this, get those dogs in there and set it up. And I'm gonna use my smoother just to take a couple of swipes off of there. Just like this. And I got that set just right. And you'll see how that cleans up. Just like this. Okay, I'll do the other side. There you go. It's, it's simple when you have the, your plane set just right and a sharp blade. So, the other plane I'm gonna use today that I've had for quite some time, and you'll, hopefully we can get this. You see all those saw blade max? I also need to maintain this at a perfect 90, okay? So, what I wanna do is just take that, and I just, I've had this plane for years. It's a 95 or, it's um, built off a 95. This is a Lee Nielsen. Uh, and this is the righty. I know they made a lefty. And you see this? This fence, I put it right up against here like this. You could actually tilt it up and use it in this form. But you see right in here when this blade is set just right, I could take that full shaving off and that's all it takes. So you'll see when I'm taking this second cut, you see how I can look right down in there and I know I got it. Just like that, and th oh my God, I wish, you, I wish you could feel how smooth that shear cut is. And you can see right here when I do it, I'm getting that whole piece perfect. And let's just look at 90 on this. Both faces, I'm gonna take it and I get that perfect 90, absolutely. No light coming through all the way down. So the other part I'm just gonna do is the bottom here. It came together, that butt joint pretty flush, but I'm just gonna clean that up as well so it sits nice and flat on the bench when I'm sawing. So once again, smoother. This four and a half is just right for it. Now the other thing I do, and everybody wants to know what this wax is, I put a little wax in the bottom for it to be a little bit smoother and it just glides on that cherry. And that's all I'm gonna do. So the beauty of using a hand plane like this and flushing this, feel that Chris. Wow. Pretty nice, huh? Nice and smooth. Mm -hmm. I know it might be overkill, but just something this simple. You can practice with hand tools and get really good with them. Okay, so now what I wanna do is I wanna make that curve at a perfect 90. So I don't have to think about it when I go to cut those little small pieces of molding, the returns. 
So I am going to, and I'll make one of these for just about every saw I do hand work with to cut smaller pieces, or do some quick cross cuts, or 45s or 22 halves, whatever I wanna do. So what I wanna make sure is set my benchmark on here. I put my 1281 woodpeckers, because I know this is dead on accurate, at 90. I went about halfway in the box, okay? And I'm just gonna lock it down. Now, I'm not going to put it in the middle here to bend that tongue. I'm just gonna put it right here. And this is basically my training wheel or my guide. So then I'm gonna take my saw like this and hopefully Chris will get a shot over my shoulder here as I'm cutting this on both sides. So I'm looking for daylight here right in here, and I'm just gonna take small strokes to cut my curve line on here. And then what I'll do is I'll come over here as well and start cutting straight down, okay? I'll bring it back over and I'll come over here and make sure I am cutting perfectly at 90. And then once I get that going, I'm just gonna cut right down at 90 all the way. And you're gonna see, look, I'm almost right there where I need to be. I'm going to use both of them. So you're gonna notice the backing part right here of the saw, okay? You're gonna notice that I, I am limiting myself. That's why I made the fences exactly where I'm at because I'm going to cut, look, right down in there and I'm not gonna overcut in there. Okay, now I can make one for that saw and I've made them for this saw. And here's why I will always do this. I know this may be overkill. This plate is a little bit thicker. So I'll just have this for this saw and I'll make another one for this saw. So now we're back at the beginning. We've made our mitre box for the uh, small Japanese style pull saw. And the lineup is so easy now. I'm not gonna be chasing these. I could cut this on my uh, Capex over here, but I'll be searching, and I was tired of searching for these pieces. So I'm doing some flooring on this shoe mold. I put it up my base, and if I know I'm gonna have a lot of returns, I'll cut a bunch of these. The lineup's really easy. It's the line right here. So you can do something as simple as this. I can darken it like that, and I'm gonna bring it right into my box like this. You already have the lineup, okay? And when this starts to wear a little, just make another one. And I'm just gonna pull that. And there's my return. Look how easy that is. So the key to cutting returns on the shoe mold is you want this to sit flush up against your base molding and not keep it away. So what I did is I just sprayed some activator on there and I put a little CA glue on there. And man, you can prep these ahead of time if need be. But boy, once you get it on there, and that'll sit perfectly flush. That's nice and flush back there. Now sit perfectly flush up against your baseboard when that has to terminate. <clears throat> so sometimes your casing's right here and your baseboard goes into your casing and this sits proud. This is just a really nice accent on your shoe, shoe mold instead of grinding it. So there you go. And as we always say, be positive and stay sharp.